Hey, everybody. Hey, Emily Miller. Hi, Kate Richburg. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. The good. light, your lighting is so, you look very glowing today. Oh, it's, it's these, um, I have these honeycomb shades in the, uh, this window over here and they are such a nice diffuser. I have to say, I really, I really like them a lot. Yeah, so. little, a little diffuse light always. Uh, it's soft, it's you know, I mean, yeah. I do have, I do have a little more of a task light here. I'll bring in when the right. time comes, but right. um, that, that nice kind of soft, you know, e uneven yeah. blendy light. Hmm. Looks nice with all of your filter. beads and stuff it's in nice. the background. It's nice. Well, we are going to have a fantastic day today. Before we jump into Emily's project, let me tell all of you all that you can find everything bead shop related at beadshop.com on Instagram, at the bead table on Facebook, and of course, hit that like, subscribe, and notification button over on YouTube. You can find all of the information on the project and the products that Emily is using today on this just incredible incredible piece that she's making. Uh, jump on over to the broadcast, uh, the broadcast page, or the project page rather, on our website. The project is called Log Cabin. And this is part one. It's going to be a two-part show. We're going to do part one now. And then in just a couple of weeks, it's going to be on the 8th, I believe, of February. Let me just make sure that date is correct. It is. Um, Emily's going to come back and do part two. So if you're working along with her, you'll have some time to, um, you know, work uh, on your loomed piece, etc., and then uh, go from there. So that's that right there. Today, we are going to be going over, Emily's going to be going over some really important things. She's going to be going over creating a pattern for this piece. It's a pattern that she created, um, and it's in the handout. So you can go to the project page for Log Cabin and um, download the handout out at your leisure. Um, so how she created the pattern, how she uh, picked the appropriate beads, the needles, and the thread for the project. She's going to show you how she warps that Ojibwa loom for weaving and getting started on the project. So again, you can find it under Log Cabin over on Bead Shop. So Emily... Um, here's the, the piece you've got going on. I'm going to highlight this so people can see it. Um, talk a little, so let's just jump in, talk about, uh, what this piece is and, uh, what we're going to do. Sure. So this is my split loom piece made with the pattern I'm calling log cabin. And, you know, I've, I had been looking at split loom pieces for a long time and it's definitely something that had been in my kind of my shopping cart of things to do my list. Um, and I finally got around to it when we had our retreat last year at um, San Juan Batista with all the gang. And it was a lot of fun and I was pretty well prepared for it, but um, I kind of a made up a pattern on the fly. And this one is also based on a quilt pattern. So the first pattern I used um, that you've, we've shown a couple of different times um, was also based on a quilt pattern. But this was one that I spent a little time with um, thinking about colors and making decisions about colors. But I based this on, and let me just turn around and grab something on my shelf right behind me because I put sure. it there close by, but not close enough, just so that I could pull it out um, again and show it to you. So I have a vintage uh, split loom piece that was a gift somebody gave me. And this was what I used to kind of base this measurement on and kind of what I started with. So this is the vintage one. And this is the one that I made. Gosh, um, that's so pretty. I know. And it's it's really in, in pretty poor condition. You know, this is this is the effect of having threads that are not nylon or man-made fiber polyester threads. Um, these are cotton threads. And the beads are super, super irregular. I think you can see right in here where there's just some tiny skinny ones, which were sort of a bad choice. They should have edited those out. And some bigger, fatter ones up here too that um, I would have not used. But um, it's really got some lovely colors and some really lovely designs in it. So I use this as my inspiration just for the measurement. 
This particular one, uh, in the number of beads across, number of rows, this particular one looks like it's a little longer than mine. So my necklace is about 26 or 27 inches long. And this one's probably a little bit longer. Let's just measure it side by side. Yeah, it's a little bit longer, a couple inches longer. So mm -hmm. in length. Um, but it's this vintage one is really quite charming. And, you know, it'd be fun to recreate it completely. Um, I, I don't know if the original maker is long gone or not, but um, it would be a fun one. We could absolutely recreate it. Oh, uh, wow. And look at those ends. Let's show those ends real quick, Emily. Yeah. So this is actually a lariat. And it looks like there are some old Venetian trade beads on there. Yep. Um, gosh, that's really uh, gorgeous. And some probably some Peking glass here. Yeah. And they use the same colors, the, the kind of... Um, greasy gold and the rust and the greasy mm -hmm. blue. Um, greasy is a term um, to describe beads that almost look like they're made out of Vaseline. So they have mm -hmm. kind of a semi-transparent feel to them. They're not necessarily matte, but um, they have that kind of a, of a glow to them that's a little bit different than um, what we might see today in an opaque glass bead. Um, you know, if we compare those yellows together, this modern yellow is a little bit warmer. This one's a little mm -hmm. cooler. Um, here's that really um, bright red that I chose. You know, that orange and this one's a more muted. Here's an orange, mm -hmm. a modern orange kind of side by side and a modern brick color over here. Mm -hmm. So we could absolutely recreate this just, you know, bead for bead if we want. Yeah, it's um, really and we could thing. absolutely use our Ojibwa loom, which is probably mm -hmm what this was made on something very similar to that mm -hmm. you know age wise i don't pro i don't really i can't really speculate i i guess i would say probably maybe anywhere 1900s to 1930s kind of manufacture yeah. on this i would concur on that yeah yeah you know i think after the 50s things got a little bit more um, the colors maybe got a little bit more crisp and a little bit more modern maybe um, yeah and it had a little more yeah it had a little more of a pop art feel isn't the right term but you know yeah. what i mean yeah um this has a very muted desert tones kind of feeling to it yeah absolutely it's a pretty um, piece for sure yeah it's um, gorgeous and i don't what know a maybe... neat thing to have oh and i see it comes together there so it's actually not a lariat those no. are ends that um, so it's a split loom. So it right. starts with this. Uh, blah. It starts with that pendant in the center, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then the weaving splits mm -hmm. apart. Now I use the same measurement across, which was fifteen beads, fifteen beads, mm -hmm. and that odd number kind of gives me a natural gap. So I dropped out in the center mm. one whole row of beads and that gives me that natural opening. But mm -hmm. you can have, if you have an even number of beads in your design, that's fine. You'll still be able to do this and you should have no trouble. Um, and if you wanted to make that gap larger, you certainly can do that as well. Um, you could taper it if you want to have a V shape there. Um, right. You could step it up in steps, uh, more of a geometric kind of presentation. Absolutely. So. Right. And so it's just simply dropping however many beads you want to drop right, um, to make that gap. Nice. Right. Now, technically, if you end up with extra threads in the middle, as we're weaving, we may have extra warps here. That's okay. Just ignore them for now. Go ahead and weave your straps. And then you can clip them out and weave them back into the pendant. And then they'll just disappear. So you don't have to worry about any extra threads if you have spares in the middle. Okay. But you'll see what I mean when we get a little closer to yeah, going along here. It's really I'm nice. Um, picking up, I got to pick up all my loose little beads that fell off that time. This poor split loom necklace, I probably should um, put it in a frame or something where it's not going to get moved around so much, but it was really a good one for inspiration. So um, I've showed you before, I believe the fact that I like to pattern a bunch with um, graph paper and pens. These are the pens that I tend to use, um, these Stabilo um, markers. They're pretty easy to come by if you look at Joann's or any place like that. They're I have easy. one in my hand right now. <laughs> oh, good. And they're, they're a nice kind of color combination. One of my green ones did dry out, so I'm going to have to replace it. But um, they do give you a lot of color kind of combinations to work with. 
So I did do this initially with my piece and I, I, I will show you that, you know, it, you can't just stop it. Just wait. You can't just start with just one and finish with just one. I have, uh, let's see how many versions here. I think there's quite a few. So this was sort of a, a first look. I was sort of thinking about recreating that uh, vintage piece and um, kind of kind of playing around with some designs, but there are multiples. Oh, real pretty. Right? So playing around is totally what you should be doing with this. And, you know, I have some bits over here. If I make a mistake and I'm well into a design and I wanna make a correction, um, I'll use these kind of correcting tapes to just go right over the color and then just color in. I might Very find clever. one in here somewhere that I did that on, but I think right there. Um, so it, it's pretty easy to fix your mistakes. When it came time to do the handout for this one, I did transfer this information over to a spreadsheet. And you know, you don't have to be a crazy computer person to figure this out, but a spreadsheet, it has little cells, little boxes. And for most spreadsheet programs, you can tell it how many wide you would like to have and how many long. And so I already knew that I needed 15 and I figured on about having about double that. So about 30 rows long. And so I did, I used my spreadsheet to actually make the graph that's in the handout. That's and this so kind of clever. Afforded me a couple of fun, easy ways to kind of give you the numbers. You know, a lot of times when um, you want to recreate something, there's numbers sort of on the side and you have to kind of go back and forth and A and B and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a lot of work. So what I did was I used the color number to designate these two. And then this next color number is these two. This next color number, these two. This one actually covers all of these over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So rather than filling in every box and making it look real busy, it was easier to just do at the beginning of each row. And you're going to start down here at the bottom and kind of work your way up. Okay. We'll, I'll talk more about that in just a minute too. But just for reference, any of these numbers, just designate the, that little group, that little group, that little group, that little group. You're going to wow. work your way across. And I thought it worked so much easier than um, trying to follow uh, Very clever. something where you kind of go back and forth, you know, with, with numbers and patterns. So let me ask you real quick. We had a sure. question about your um, graph paper that you were using. Sure. What size was that? Do you want to flash the cover? Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. This is a, a book from Staples and it's reversible four square, five square. And so on one side of the page, you can actually see here at the gap, one side is smaller, one side is larger. And for graphing, I'm not really too worried about the mm. measurement, how many per inch or anything like that. I'm just looking for the squares. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. So this just comes from Staples and um, pretty much anywhere. I love them because they're kind of bound and they come with holes. So if I want to save it, I can, I can save it. And it's inexpensive, you know, um, it doesn't take too much time and, and it's kind of fun to do the drawing yourself, I think, but you do, you do you, um, yeah. as far right. as inspiration goes, boy, the world is your oyster for looming. Um, I love looking at patterns and I'm a big collector of all kinds of patterns. I've showed this book before. This is actually in the, I put this in the handout, I think. Um, but this is a book um, that is actually full of gridded patterns. And you can see all my post-it note um, bookmarks, <laughs> things that I liked. Um, and if I flip it open, I'll show you what it looks like. So these grids give you everything from alphabets, which is kind of fun to play around with. Um, to, let's see, let me go to the back. Lovely graphics of all sorts. And here's the repeat, right? It actually shows you a broad line, a dark line that shows oh, that repeat. So, so no, you only yeah. have to really do this part and then you just repeat over and over. And you can turn these wow. to go up and down or to go side to side, truly your choice. A lot of these are, um, I've actually done this one. 
That's really um, a lot of, and I've done, I've done that one too, that Greek key. Uh, a lot of these are um, from tile or mm. from medieval clothing. I've done this one before in loom. It looks real nice. That kind of uh, sinuous wave shape, but it's full of things. So these patterns are great for anything that's a rectangular, a regular grid. Wow. Knitting, cross stitch, crochet, um, needlepoint, looming, regular weaving, wow. um, all those things. And it on the back of the cover, it actually shows you all the different mediums, tapestry, needlepoint, patchwork. Oh, that's cool. Right? So it shows you kind of all mosaic. So you could actually lay tile like where these came from originally. Wow. Um, so these and, are all um, medieval sources, right? Mostly and they're, medieval, yes. And they're uh, copyright free, correct? I believe so. Here's a few that are done in, um, oh, I think in needlepoint, but done in color. So you can sort of see what they look like. And what about with peyote stitch for these, Emily? Peyote wouldn't be quite no. Right this, we'd right? have to. We would use this for a jumping off point, mm -hmm. but because peyote is offset, right? Each row is not right regularly above the next one. Right. We would have to. We would have to do some some um, editing of these to right. kind of get get them to be suitable for that. Gotcha. So there's also some issues with grids and curves. And here's a good example because actually there's two good examples on this page. So if you decide that you would like to make a pattern that has circles, rounded things in it, curves, you have to go along and stair step your way through that curve, okay? So that's another place where you're going to want to make some editorial decisions about how you put your pattern together. Mm -hmm. You know, if if your curve, let's say you're making a circle, um, it's going to not be a pyramid, but it's going to have some stair steps as it goes around. And so that might influence you on colors that you put side by side, how much you want that stair step to show up, um, how visible you want it to be, or how important it is to that it shows or not shows. Um, I think in this pattern here with the, um, here's some rounds where that stair stepping is very visible. And some of the smaller rounds actually, even though they're supposed to be a round, they only have one little stair step, right? One little notch there to give them that round shape. These letters that are supposed to look round have that stair stepping as well. But it, I think I kind of, repairs that little stair step. So I wouldn't be too terribly worried about it um, when you're doing a round a circle or a rounded shape. Um, just just keep in mind what you're gonna your effect might be that you're gonna gonna kind of get with. Great. Okay? And Emily, will you show the cover one more time? It's Absolutely. in the, the handout it's listed. I, I it have it in the handout, yeah. Mm -hmm. It and is I believe this is just an ebook now that you order, but I think you can still find um other copies and she's got several pattern books mm -hmm. Nancy spies yeah and someone um, said that it is on Amazon currently so you can oh good yeah mm -hmm. so there's a couple other books that I think are kind of fun to look at this one um is kind of something I look at a lot because I'm inspired by it although I'm not a quilter um it does have some great patterns that again are grids quilts typically are kind of a grid shape and so they can be applied um, right to what we're doing and you know looking for colors looking for patterns um, I think all this is kind of it's just um, ammunition for your um, thoughts you know oh, it that's just gives nice you that book. inspiration mm -hmm. yeah I love those hexagons too the hexi shape would be a really fun one to um, loom we could do that one you know the English uh, paper piece hexagon yes yes right I have some English paper piecing burning a hole in a little work basket. Oh, you gave me some, and I don't know if it's ever going to happen, Kate. I, well, I, I don't know. You never know. Look at this color palette. Isn't that pretty? Oh, it's so pretty. Right? I so did. I, I forgot about that. Sorry. What? <laughs> I did give you some. You did. Yeah. Sorry about that. So well, that's pretty, too. You know, um, black background or a black ground um with bright colors or with colors would be really striking as well in this particular piece 
Um, and that would be kind of a fun thing to play around with. We could use both uh, matte and um, glossy black beads would be really pretty. So here's another nice one um, that looks really good and would make a great loomed piece. Oh yeah, that like vintage spools or I can't remember what they call it, right. but yeah, it's nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting, you know, they make little comments too about the colors and like, I didn't notice it in this bigger picture, but there's a little strip of mustard colored piping there and it shows better in this photo, but it does really make a nice break in that background or that border color and the gray. Um, I think that does add a, a nice little touch. So that, and those are all things that are totally, um, isn't this cool, uh, approachable. If oh, you get a chance- yeah, I um, love Love it, love it, love it. I, if you get a chance to look at Guy's Bend quilts also, that's another place that I find um, pretty inspirational for color. And um, and then this is an older book about um, loom weaving. It's primarily kind of focused on making handbags, which you, we've talked about before. And um, it, But it does a, have a bunch of great loom weaving patterns and projects that you could play around with. Look at this pretty hanging. Oh my goodness. Right? Wow. So it doesn't have to be a piece of jewelry. It could be something else. But it's got some patterns and some technical stuff in it, some gra some graphs that are kind of fun to play around with. Mm -hmm. And that kind of morphs over into that. Wow, that's pretty. beautiful. Yeah. It really is quite an oeuvre of study. Um, Definitely. Sure. Definitely. Would you uh, flash that quilt book, M, one more time? Sure. They're in the um, handout, folks. Emily listed all of these, but quilting with a modern slant. There it is. Yeah. You know, that one, it has some great color. It has some great inspiration. Um, and then Kate turned me on to this one a few years back. Um, there's a couple of books that are kind of like this that I enjoy perusing when I'm coming up with something. And um, yes, this one my has, favorite, my favorite. This one has kind of talks about colors and gives you kind of some historical references for them and kind of where they come from and maybe meanings of them. Um, and so it's not photos, not pictures, but it has colors in it and then descriptions and um, explanations about where they come from. I was going to try and pull one out here. Prussian blue. So yeah. it talks about how that came about as a, as a material and a color. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting to kind of read on and this is just maybe more for inspiration than, than anything else, but you know, folks like to put some thought and inspiration into their projects. I, I am, I'm here for you, you know, for sure. I love it. Um, would you show the cover of that color book one more time? There's a, sure. a request. There it is. She also wrote, uh, Cassia St. Clair, she's a British um, uh, author, authoress, as my grand would say. And she um, wrote one on the history of fabric. Um, she wrote another one that I have. They're really great books. Um, there's another book that I don't have at my hand right here, but Kate might have hers close by. It's called The Language of Design. Oh. Uh, which is a Tim McCrate book. Isn't that what it's called? Yeah. Let me, uh, Design Language. Design Language. Yeah. And that's another see. one that um, is really good to kind of get your your thought process going along if you feel like you're stumped. You know, I'm happy that you use the pattern I came up with, but if it's not your cup of tea, that's fine. Um, I also would really love to redo this pattern in blacks, white, and gray. Um, so I was chatting over this with my sister who is a quilter, um, mostly an art quilter, but she does all kinds of quilts. I have quilt hangings in every room of my house oh. and on every surface. Um, and we started talking about this design uh, this log cabin pattern, which is built around a center square. And um, then it has pieces going around and around and around. It gets bigger and bigger as it goes out. And she made me one um, that I have in my bedroom that's uh, very dark colors, black background, very rich, saturated colors. And, um, 
and is kind of wonky. So the squares are, none of it's very square. It's all kind oh, of cool. ir irregular. And I love it. It's just one of my most favorite ones. It's my winter quilt, my winter wall quilt. Um, in the summertime, I have a lighter colored one. I switch it out. Oh, I love um, it. But doing this in black, white, and gray, um, and maybe with a little bit of silver lined or some alabasters and, um, you know, some uh, metallic silvers and grays, I think would be really spectacular. It would be um, cool. You yeah. know, I took, a, I took a bag making class this weekend. What a surprise. And the instructor was talking about, um, she was talking about using her neutral um, and she uses black and white as her neutral, which was kind of cool to see. So it was kind of like a running theme in her pieces. So I think that would be great. Yeah. Great yeah. To use. Yeah. I, I think this one, I may, I may buck the trend here um, this next two weeks while we're making another one. So I'm going to make another one. I may buck the trend and just do a black, white, gray one. It would be fun. It would be um, really fun. So there's a couple of questions here, and I think this is a good place to segue into it. Sure. Um, what are your suggestions on choosing colors? You'll bring your your palette mm. stuff in next. Yeah. When you look at the seed beads, uh, there are a multitude of choices. Um, multitude of choices in each color, such as blues, opaque, clear lined, etc. So how do you deal with that, Em? You know. Um, I, I tend to like saturated colors that are, um, uh, opaque is kind of my jam. I don't always use them, but it's one of the things that I tend to like. I do find that metallics for me, give me kind of the pop that sometimes that opaques kind of get a little dreary or a little static. They don't really have much movement. Um, I play around with colors a lot. In fact, when I, wove this pattern for the pendant part of this weaving i stayed very true to the colors that i chose when i started the strap and i'll show you this in a minute um i played around with colors so i sometimes replaced colors as i was going along thinking i want to see what this looks like next to it so to me it's a lot about the relationship of a bead next to a bead more so than choosing the color itself. I think a good way to kind of play around with having a palette of colors to work with is to say, if I'm going to have blue, I want a light, a dark, and a medium. So I will play with those, having those light, dark, and medium in my palette until I'm happy kind of how it turns out. Um, I do have colors that I kind of love and gravitate towards, and I have to stop myself sometimes from using them in every piece I make. Um, otherwise, your your patterns all look alike. You're, you have no no range. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I will purposefully pick a bead I'm not sure of and make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so I did stay a little farther out from opaques uh, on this piece. Um, I do think light colors tend to come forward. Dark colors tend to recede and make a background. One of the tricky things about beads, too, is that we also have transparent and semi-transparent as well as matte. Mm -hmm. um, and I call everything else that's not matte. I just, I just identify matte rather than saying something is not matte. Um, but for me, matte actually have a little bit of a glow to them. So we were talking earlier about my natural light coming in my window here. Um, so that's pretty much all natural light that you're seeing now. I'm going to bring over this task light and bring it into so that you can see how it brightens it up. But this is a daylight balance tax, task light. And I used, um, <clears throat> I think I used 15 colors in this particular piece, which is not my, my max. I used 26, I think, in the other piece that I made. Yeah. Gosh, it was so pretty. It is, and it's it's lovely to have all those options. And, and I, when I did the last piece I did, um, I didn't, I patterned on the fly. I colored on the fly. Mm -hmm. I had my pattern already, but I did color on the fly. So I approached this a little bit thinking about these were fabric scraps that I was quilting together. And when you do that, you are picking up colors to put together to be related to another color and see how they work for you. Um, I initially didn't want to use any black or white for this piece 
because black and white are, again, some of my favorites. And I was trying to break that mold a little bit. So picking up colors that I thought worked well with one another and worked well in the piece um, was a little bit of a trial and error. And I also am buying beads like you are online these days, which means you buy something and you get it home and you go, mm, that was not what I was expecting. I don't <laughs> hate it, but not it was not quite. what I was expecting. Yeah. <clears throat> so picking a few tonal ranges within a color to have in your in your uh, palette. And when I say palette, I really mean your collection. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a paint palette feels sort of restrictive when you only have like five colors. You can make a lot of colors with those five, mm -hmm. but with beads, you have to really consider what they're next to, what, they're, what their neighbor is going to be doing and how it's mm -hmm. going to be reacting. I also planned for this pattern to run off the edge. Mm. So in my mind's eye, there's actually another row of these rust colored matte beads over here. And then the pattern kind of continues. Let me show you that on my graph paper, because I did think about that. And I decided rather than having the pattern kind of finish mm -hmm. at an edge, that I would imagine that it continued. And so well, this was one of the advantages of using graph paper. Oh, yeah, I see so, that. I used a, a, a symbol. Um, this is like a little loop, X's, squares, rounds, mm, checkerboard, mm, spirals. So I imagine that that pattern kind of ran on out of view. Um, and so I, I was able to kind of help me keep all of my patterning kind of happening in a nice way. Um, and so these ones would also have been running out of view off the grid as it were, right? And it gives it, Emily, a really, I think, um, like f modern, fresh uh, look to it for sure. Yeah, not having something that um, that is really con constrained within the boundaries of what you're making. Boy, we're getting, we're getting really deep already here real quick. Yeah, we um, are. <laughs> that seemed to be what I was kind of, aiming for right it's so gorgeous. i love it thank you so the pattern that's in the handout is two pages and literally it's the same two pages so this is the pattern for the pendant part that's the first part of the pattern and then the second one is the pattern for the straps so what I did when I created my straps, I finished my pendant and I started weaving on the left-hand side um, and I wove this pattern and then I started weaving this pattern right on top of it. And I just continued my way along until I got to the length that I needed. You know, I did use 11s for this. You can use delicas or cylinder beads for this if you like. You can use eights for this. I think at getting to the size six, it's going to be a little bigger and maybe the detail is going to get a little bit lost, but you could definitely use bigger beads than 11s. I consider this project uh, a entry level beginner with open to a challenge kind of person. It's long. It's about seven to eight hours probably of looming, not including finishing. And um, so it's a weekend, you know, three or four hours, two days in a row, and you'd be done. Um, but if you're a beginner, this is very straightforward. It's not very difficult. It just takes a little bit more time and a little bit more of a commitment. It's not very bead heavy. In fact, you could probably make four of these necklaces with the amount of beads you're going to buy, okay, or more. So you're not using as many beads as you might think. Um, and none of what you're doing here is very difficult. It's all very regular. It's all very um, lather, rinse, repeat. You're going to do the same thing over and over again until you're really tired of it. And then you go do something else for a while. But to make the straps, I just continue to weave this pattern over and over again on both straps. And it doesn't look like that when you look at the straps, right? So as I got to the yeah. back, Oh yeah, I can see that. Right? As I got to the back, I simply, so here's the same portion here and here, but they're separated by quite some distance. As I worked my way up to the top, I started playing around with other colors in that position. 
right? I extended some lengths. I played, I repeated a little section that I really liked. You get very intimate with your beads <laughs> in this process because you're going to be looking at very small quantities of that same bead over and over again. I am absolutely love in this in love with this 4243, which is I forget what the color name of it is, but it's a it's a kind of a very light topaz alabaster silver lined number. And I'm absolutely infatuated with this bead. I got to tell you, yeah. it's really a beautiful bead. It really looks great in this browns kind of grouping, but mm -hmm. it really plays nicely with the red and green as well. And I didn't use very much of it. And now I really wish I had, I would go back and do this again with more of that one in it because I just mm -hmm. thought they were the bomb. Yeah. They, it right? really, what I love that you did with this piece is it's offset with the pattern and the colors. I mean, it really does echo that log cabin kind of scrappy quilt feeling. Um, that's really pleasing to my eye. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Me too. Me too. So a quick question, Emily, and I'm sure, sure. you're going to go over it now. Um, with construction, you're going to warp, you're going to get onto warping the loom and yes. we want to talk about your little palette, how you have your beads laid out. Yep. Um, but uh, doing the straps, do you do them one side, then the other? Do you do them continuously? Um, all that kind of stuff. But I think you're going to answer that question shortly. I am going to answer all those questions. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll move this loom out of the way because it's holding up my paper, but now it's kind of superfluous for the moment. I bought this paint palette on Amazon for watercolor painting. And I found that for this project where I have this many colors, it's actually super helpful. They do migrate just a little bit. Of course, I've jostled this around a few times, but I love having some kind of a soft um, uh, bead surface in the background. This could be you know, a piece of velour towel, um, these bead mat things, the velvet tray from your from your bead tray anything like that to keep the beads from bouncing around too much even though i'm going to use small amounts of these beads i'm pretty much going to use all the colors the whole time so there's really no point in making things that you're going to put in and away take out and put away all the time this was super helpful for me to lay it out with the numbers and um, if i didn't have something like this i was going to just lay it on my mat i'd put little stickers um you know a little piece of paper that said the number, the color number on each one. So that it'd be just a little quicker and it would move along a little easier. Um, but this was a really, a, a good little find. This is just written on with Sharpie, use a little alcohol wipe and it'll come right off. Um, and then it can go back in my watercolor um, pile of watercolor supplies <laughs> that I've acquired pretty quickly. Um, right, uh, there with your other, uh, with your quilting, et cetera. Right. Knitting. I finished the blanket the last couple of days. You'll be happy. That's your one up on me. And because I'm home with COVID. So, you know, perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, so the watercolor palette is handy, but not 100% necessary. And it is not as easy to kind of pick up the beads as it is on the on the soft surface. But it's very nice for organizing. Um when you pick up your beads, and I cannot say this enough, I know I sound like a broken record because I bring it up every time we talk about seed beads. Look at the beads on your needle before you weave. There are some wider and some narrower beads in all of these, and some of them tend towards a little wider or narrower as a color. You are going to get very, very intimate with your beads. You're going to know them very carefully. All of these um, matte Duracoats are a little bit wider than my, my opaques. My pink opaque, matte pink hair is, um, uh, it's actually, what is it called? Matte opaque light rose is actually quite a bit smaller than most of the other beads. As is this red one here, this 313, doesn't have the name on it, 313 SF, also a little on the small side, right? So check out what's going on there. And you know, I didn't need to put out much of these, each of these colors, each of these little containers is plenty of those colors. Um, if you get mixed together and you can't stand unmixing them, then that's the lowest commitment that you can do. Just a small amount of each one, put a little sticky label. I mean, even just a piece of tape, painter's tape with the number written on it by each one, that'll be a plenty of, of information for you. 
Um, triangle, having a triangle around to scoop and put it back in your containers, a great idea. Uh, I guess, do you guys know about that shrink or that um, plastic wrap? And I think it's called seal tight. Anyway. Oh, it's, yeah. It's like for your food. Well, like your food and it really, really sticks. Yeah. And you can actually put it over a pallet like this and kind yeah. of push it down on the edges and it'll keep everything in. I mean, if you got cats or kids or, you know, you're struggling with people getting in your stuff um, and you're trying to make that be tidier, that's that's perfectly legit way to go. Okay. So I'm going to set this just to the back for the moment. And um, I think it's time to get our looms warped, Kate, because we've talked about design. We've talked about beads. Yeah, let's um, do it. And I think it's time to get our looms warped. So I'm going to readjust my camera just a little bit. Okay. Uh, move some, move some, move some of my fancy uh, stuff and change where I'm sitting because I want to stand up for this part. Right. So that you and guys can see how I do this. While you're talking about looms, um, M, um, yeah. oh, and the, the product is called, Kim has it, it's called Press and Seal. Press and Seal. Thank yeah. you so much. There was another question about looms. You're going to use the Ojibwa loom mm -hmm. that you carry here. Yep. Um, I, someone's asking about the jewel loom. I feel the jewel loom is a little small for this project. Well. But, oh, go ahead. Here's the thing. Um, you can absolutely use pretty much any loom to do this with. What you'd end up doing with smaller looms is you would end up making separate pieces and then attaching them to one another. So although we're going to do this in a continuous warp, there's no reason that you couldn't do this on a smaller loom. I find it easier on this bigger loom and less effortful. But you could absolutely do this on a smaller loom if that's what you were working with. You could weave it on on a um, on a design board. I know you like to weave on those design boards, Kate, and they they work great. I do think their limitations um, are just in in ease and speed of working. Mm -hmm. um, having a Jipwa loom or having a Larry loom that's bigger, wider, kind of gives you some advantages in the technical putting the technical efforts of working but that's sure. it yeah you sure. could absolutely weave this in multiple pieces and seam it all together and no one would ever know right right and that's how like textile weaving is done in yeah. many um many cultures around the world that don't have those large looms like with backstrap yeah. and stuff yeah. like that yeah so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's woven in a strip and then attached to itself so mm -hmm. exactly you know um, and, and it be either becomes part of the design or it is meant to be that way from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So, so you want to switch over cameras now, Kate, to this big of the upright um, yeah. camera? Let me, let me do that. Sorry okay. about that. It's all right. Uh, there you are. Em. There I am. Okay. And this guy's actually out of the way, which maybe I don't have to move it after all. <laughs> all right then. So Ojibwa loom, right? So this is a great loom and it has some really good advantages. It's super portable. It's super lightweight. You can break it down into parts when you're not using it and put it away in a small space, um, which I appreciate in a craft um, accessory <laughs> or tool. So it has some little eye bolts that go in the bottom and it has warping boards at each end and dowels that give you the length. So what I've found with looming is primarily I would like to have as least amount of tangling, catching things as I could possibly have around my loom. So we can adjust these warping boards in, in width or length that we would be, we would be weaving by unscrewing the eye bolts, loosening them up, and then moving them down these dowels closer together, closer to one another, right? Right. But I think having tangly things like this kind of poking out is sort of a recipe for frustration. So what I like to do, and I think makes the most sense for this particular project, is pushing the warping board just to the very end of the dowels 
and you can actually countersink the dowels just a little bit so that they're within the wood of the warping board. It's not going to work. You're not going to change the stability of this or anything, but they're hidden inside that warping board so that they're not, not even flush. They're a little bit recessed. And that means you're not going to get stuck on those. No tangling happening with those guys, right? So when I work with this, you can work with it flat on the table like this in front of you. I also find it's handy to find a couple of um, books or uh, a brick wrapped in a towel or whatever it takes to lean this up against because working kind of upright is easier on your neck. Um, we are going to work from the bottom of this loom going upwards and we're going to need most of it. So we're going to start out pretty far at the bottom when we start looming to begin with. We want to make sure we give ourselves that whole span to work with. We need to make a, a necklace piece that that opening is about 13 inches long. So we're going to have 13 on one side, 13 on the other. That gives you 26 inches. That should fit over most adults' heads. Anywhere 24 to 27 is about minimum that I would go for. I wouldn't try and make something smaller than 24 inches to go over someone's head. Uh, if you decided that you didn't want this to be a long necklace, you could absolutely put a button and loop closure on the back and it could be a short necklace with a shorter pendant in the front. Your, your choice, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do it the really the long way, right? Now, I like to do a continuous warp, um, especially on a loom like this because there's less places to tie off um, we could add more pegs along here, more um, screw eyes if we wanted to, to tie things off. But we're also going to weave in all of our warp threads. So the warp threads are the long threads that go this way. The weaving of the weft thread is the one that goes crisscross back and forth. So we could tie off multiple places back here if we wanted to. But doing a continuous warp also means that I could actually loosen this a little bit and slide it down and move my beadwork down. So I would actually have more, I would gain more warping length, beading length. You could actually bead all the way around this if you wanted to, to make something really long, like a belt or a hat cover or a strap or something else, okay? So let me grab my thread and I better have a scissor at hand here too. Um, I'm using the new thread, the AA Ceylon from K that I quite like. And, you know, um, threads are somewhat of a personal choice. Let's talk about thread for just a minute. Um, most of the threads you're going to see for beading these days um, are these nylon threads. Come on a spool. Looks like that. And they're a filament thread. So there are multiple strands of thread laid together. Not unlike dental floss, right? Dental floss is flat like a tape. Um, and this is very similar to that. Uh, Nymo thread, Ceylon, Eslon, um, trying to think of all the other names. There's a bunch. Most of them are, are that way. They have very little stretch, which is good. They're very strong, um, which is also good. We're going to put um, a needle and thread on this and pass through all of our beads at least twice. So we're going to have two threads running through each one. And we're going to have a thread on either side for looming. So choose a thread that you really like to work with. Um, I like Eslon, Ceylon. I like 1G. I like, um, what's the one that Janice really likes? I like that one too. <laughs> so I like Silamide, which is an older thread. What you want to watch out for with most of these threads, though, is a little bit of graying. Or... So we're going to pass the needle, the thread through the needle at the eye and of the needle. K-O, Emily. K-O, sorry. K-O is that? Mm -hmm. K-O's a good one. Um, what we want to watch out for is fraying. And I find that most of these filament threads have fraying as one of the things that does happen with them occasionally. So where the thread goes through the eye of the needle, watch for that bend because you're going to work with it back and forth quite a bit. And if the threads, that little, little filaments begin to fray at that point, they're going to fray right there at the eye of the needle. So be mindful of that. Keep an eye on it. If you see that fraying, stop with that piece of thread, finish, don't finish the row you're on, start a new thread, move on from there. Um, 
So just keep an eye on that one spot. You can wax these threads that helps them stick for a little bit, but it doesn't, it just is on the gliding so much on the durability. So you'll find that um, that fraying might happen to you. Any thread questions, Kate? Uh, no, we're in good shape. Okay. I'm, I'm feeling a little time, time critical now. I feel like I need to get moving. Yeah, no, so, we're doing fine. We've got about 30 minutes left down, so we're doing fine. I'm going to tie a knot in the end of this thread. And I'm going to do it like a surgeon's knot. I'm making a loop of thread going through it twice. And I'm going to tie it right onto one of the eyes of this loom. And I'm going to finish with another one so that I'm attached. Okay. Now, once I've got my thread attached, I'm going to warp this loom by going around its whole length. I'm holding the thread in my hand that's moving. And I'm actually going to go towards the middle a little bit more, make it easier on myself later. And Emily, just real quick, you're using the same thread for both the warp and the weft. I am. Mm -hmm. And I chose white here. Um, you know, your thread, typically in seed bead work, our thread is not meant to be seen. So you can choose a thread that is either on accent or um, disappears into your weaving. It's your choice. It's an artist's choice sort of sort of situation. So I'm gonna carefully wrap my thread around this loom. And I'm putting each thread into one of the guides in these warping bars. Most looms, have a set number of, or set width of warping bar. Some of the more expensive Murex looms have different warping bars for different sizes of beads. Um, it's pretty common, you know, um, to have just the one size. Mm -hmm. So don't be, don't be afraid of that. I need to have one more thread than I do beads. So if I'm starting with 15, I need 16 threads, right? Mm -hmm. So from here, what we're doing is pretty much the same as every other loom you've maybe attempted or read about or looked at. Mm -hmm. The process is the same. We're getting our threads on the loom, our warp threads. Mm -hmm. And we want to, we're not, I'm not worrying about tension quite yet. That's going to come mm -hmm. in just a second. Um, all looms have some sort of tensioning device. Um, either you have to do it in setup like you would do it right now by by pulling quite firmly on your threads. Mm -hmm. I'm pulling taut, but I'm not pulling very tight at this moment. Mm -hmm. Just tight enough to keep them kind of in the warp bars. Mm -hmm. I'll pause here and give you a little look at what that looks like. All right. And you can see um, uh, there's a, there is a couple of thread questions I'm going to oh, okay. show you. Um, first... Uh, someone is saying that they like using Fireline for warp and KO for the weft. Can you mix threads? And then the second part of that question is, do you use two threads on the first wrap of the warp and the last wrap of the warp for, um, whoops, sorry. Hang on a second, Em. Uh, you fell out of, uh, uh, camera here. I'm just soloing you. You're good. It just fell out yeah. of solo. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the two threads on the first and last thread for stability. So uh -oh. hang on. There we go. Try that. All right. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, let me take that from the beginning. Uh, talking about Fireline. I like Fireline a lot. It's not as drapey and flexible a thread as I might like for this process. So I'm, I'm not terribly concerned with you mixing threads. And certainly if you're using cut beads or um, beads that have rough edges, um, check glass sometimes, um, metal beads, I think fire lines are really good choice. Um, I have not woven with it in this particular 
kind of process. So I have not, I don't really have an experience to share with you other than I know it's a little bit wirier than most of our other threads. Um, I have no problem with saying weave with what you like, warp with what you like. If you like it, it's the right thread for you. I don't usually use two threads on the outside edges. And um, I understand where you're going with that. It's a little more durable, you're right, but I think it's gonna show a little bit more. So I would be very more concerned then with the thread color kind of matching what my outside edge is really planning to be. If I'm using black beads and I'm using black thread, I would be down with using a double warp on the outside. I don't think it's necessary for durability, um, mostly. Uh, if you're gonna sew this down to a garment, um, which is how a lot of Native Americans approach loom work, is that it's gonna be backed on something else. Um, that might give you a stiffer, tidier, tighter, stronger edge to work with. Um, the times that I've sewn my loom work down to things, I've actually sewn through the looming itself rather than just on the edge. So I've tacked it down in a couple of spots so that it doesn't have a chance to get, you know, roughed up or anything by, by handling. Does that make, answer the questions? I hope. Yes, it does. Yes, okay. it does. Great. I'm going to count you. my threads real quick here. Five, 10. Oh, I went way too far. 15. I'm keeping my mic off so that you don't get any residual noise from me. That's so right. that's the pause. I got to count my threads again, but I think I went way too far. Oh, well. Which is not so, not so hard to do. Uh, hold on one second. I'm just going to sure. slip a piece of paper behind this and double check my count here. Five, so I'm going to show you ten, how you're checking that count. There you go. 15, 16. So <clears throat> I was checking my count by grabbing the threads like this. I was doing 5, 10, and 15, and 16, one more, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm all done. Now I'm going to take my thread and tie off. I'm going to wind around this eye a few times and then I'm going to cut my thread from the spool. Put that over there for a minute so it's out of my way. And then I'm going to go ahead and tie off on this thread. So I like to have a couple of knots. I don't think it's, um, I'm not really worried about this coming loose at this moment, but I think for later on, it's nice to have that couple of threads, a couple of knots kind of tied off so I don't have to worry. And so it's holding itself in place pretty nicely for me. And Emily, can you, uh, after you tie that, will sure. you show the, because it's a little below our sight lines. Yes, yes. I'm going to sit down here in a moment. All of that. Um, just gotcha. one moment. Sorry. No, no. Way. Nice to have it in your focal range. I am super excited to see what people come up with, and I'm really glad we are actually giving them an extra week in between um, this portion and the next portion. Okay. So I'm going to sit back down, Kate. <clears throat> so I'm back in this closer up camera. There we go. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I am going to grab another tool which I was pretty sure I had right here in my do in my little pile of laying down tools. <clears throat> um, Millie uh, was saying about how inspiring this project is and she's really looking forward to seeing the journey. Um, I, oh, I must tell you, I am super inspired by this piece as well. I've got my room sitting here and I'm just, I'm just thinking right now. <laughs> I've made one of these. Years ago, I used size eights. Uh -huh. um, so we'll see. And then we've got a seed bead question. Leslie, I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. So each of these little slots here keep, per, uh, separates my threads from the others. They may not be the size of the bead that you're using. They're actually pretty close to an 11, but what's typical and is not unusual is that my warp threads are going to pull in or spread out a little bit. You know, if we kind of eyeball this and say, yeah, that's about an 11. So here's the 15 across how that's really going to look. It's quite a bit different, right? So one tool that I could not live without anymore is the mini crochet hook. 
Um, we have a couple of these that I use for bead crochet, but really anything in the kind of 0.90 to 0.20, 2 2.0 kind of size will work for this. But to be able to reach in here and pick up a thread and move it over oh, is so satisfying. And this is actually two threads and needs to be separated. But look at that. I can just go just like that and just move those threads apart so that I know I have all my 15, 16 threads. Each one is in a little groove. If this grooving system is stressful for you or it's somehow not working up to your expectations, tape a little piece of cardstock or cardboard, thin cardboard over this, and then lay a row of beads across it, the beads you're planning to use. And that will give you the exact warp distance that you would normally have with a changeable warp situation here. Um, this is just a place to start. And really, it's just there to kind of give you that, that first row or two of threads help. After that, this is not going to be very important. Okay, so the first thread that I'm going to tie on here and weave with is actually going to pull these threads in quite a bit. Now, these threads are a little bit loose. Okay, every loom uh, pretty much has a way of tensioning your thread. And these are too loose in the sense that they're going to be hard to loom with. I want them to be taut but not too tight. If it's too tight when you weave, you will have a lot of buckling and things when you take things apart. So I'm just gonna take this loom, move it down into my lap. I'm kind of holding it between my knees. I was wondering how I was gonna manage this, but I think I got it. I'm gonna yeah, loosen, the, go. I'm gonna and, loosen and the eyes. A little more to the left, if you could. A little, just, there we go, perfect, thank you. I'm gonna loosen the eyes underneath again. And I'm going to push this warp bar away. And so this is going to give me some tension. Okay. And I'm just going to push it away a little bit like that. And then tighten that eye down again. So truly recessed now. And I'm going to make the other side match. And this is why I didn't have to worry about how tight I was warping at while I was doing it, okay? Because this gives me a much better tension adjustment. Um, so now these are kind of taut and I'm gonna be able to weave really easily with them, but they're not stretched. They still have some play and some flexibility, right? So not too tight. Don't want it to pluck like a guitar string. Um, it should be just kind of in that medium, not too loose, not too tight. If it's too loose, you will notice when you start weaving and you'll be able to tighten it still, okay? So I can move those guys out of the way and I'm gonna add some thread. <clears throat> I know I sound like a broken record when I talk about thread lengths. You really don't need to work with more than about a yard and a half at a time. If you work with a longer thread, you're gonna spend a lot of time tangling and untangling your thread. I'm also gonna recommend some other things that are gonna make you laugh. I would recommend not to loom weave with shirts with long sleeves that have buttons on the cuffs. I would actually recommend not to loom weave the shirt with buttons on the front, which I have on today. But normally I would try and have something very smooth and not tangly. Um, I find that that thread gets caught in those buttons and it's just frustrating. And so I'm just gonna make that small recommendation. You can do what you like. But I think it makes it much easier if you don't get caught um, in your shirt. So I'm going to peel off um, about a yard and a half of thread and cut it from the spool and thread a needle on. Um, a size 12 needle is probably in our best interest today. If you're using anything bigger than a... Um, 11 bead, you can absolutely use um, a size 10 needle, but I'm gonna be going through things quite a bit. And gosh, I've got all but bent needles. That's all right. That'll be fine. So I've got my end of my thread. I'm gonna use my 
needling the thread technique. So I've pinched the thread down between my thumb and forefinger, just supporting it on both sides. I'm gonna push the eye of the needle down onto the thread, pull it through. And I would add wax now if I felt like I needed some wax, okay? I'm a, I'm a righty. I'm horribly right-handed. I mean, I don't do much with my left. So I'm gonna tie my thread onto my leftmost warp thread. You lefties probably gonna work on the other side, although some of you are so good that you're ambidextrous and you do it with either side. So I'm just gonna take my thread here, the end of my thread, and I'm gonna tie it on with just a single knot to that leftmost warp thread. Okay. Take the rest of my needle and thread and feed it under my warps. And now I need to grab my pattern. And I think it's nice if you can actually have your pattern kind of somewhere where you can see it pretty easily. So I'm actually just going to tuck it right behind my loom. And I use, um, I use post-it notes a lot. Hang on to that thought because my post-it note apparently has fallen on the ground. Okay. Ah, I'm going to use a post-it note to sticky it up there. And then another way to go is take a post-it note and just put it right under the row that you're on. All right. So you'll move it up one row at a time. The little post-it note's just going to move right up, up, up as I go along. Okay. And really the post-it notes there just to kind of keep you in place. If you lose your way, stop and, and find out where you're at. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this row, first row here I've got is 4452 and I need six of those. I need two of the 2075s two of the 4220s. Oh gosh, I forgot a number here. Darn, it's 2024. It's this guy up here, that color up there. Okay. I'll have to send you an amended copy, you guys. So I'm going to pick up six beads on this first, for this first row, first row of colors, six of these gold and two of the 2075. That's over here. So I typically don't use this kind of a system for picking up beads. I usually have them flat on my work surface, but whatever turns you on, we can do whatever you like. And a 4220, um, again, setting this up so you have sort of a work area with good light and all those things going for you. And I need five of this pink guy. So. Just going to scoot through there and pick up some beads. There's five. So at this point, before I do anything else, I'm going to take a little look at these beads on my needle. And I can kind of clearly see that in this blue bead here, there is some variation in the size of the bead. And I have to make a choice now at that moment. Am I going to go forward with this or am I going to make a, a change? And I think I'm actually going to make a change. And I'm going to do it to save myself a little bit of effort. I'm going to pinch these beads and slide them off the needle. And I'm going to put a few of these guys down here on my velvet so that I can pick up a couple that I think match a lot better to one another. So I can get rid of those guys, put those beads back on. That looks much, much nicer, I think. What do you guys think? Yeah? Looks All right. good. And that's when, what you call editing your beads, right? I do. I definitely edit my beads. And, you know, I won't throw them away unless they're really, really distorted. <clears throat> but I will um, put them to the side so that I don't have to pick them up over and over again because that's super boring. And now I'm going to do my first row of looming. Can you see this okay, Kate? It would be good. Can you get a, just a hair closer, do you think, Kim? But I, I think so. Let me try and get this first one set in sure. and, and then, then I will go, zoom we in. We can go a little closer. Sure. Yeah. So we need to have one bead in between every thread. 
and it looks like it's going to, they're a little bit far apart. So I may have to do this in stages. That's okay. Hold on. How's that? Is it still sharp enough? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Feels like it's a little out of focus for me, but you'll let me know. I will. It looks pretty, looks pretty clear on my end. All right. Apparently the UPS man is here or <laughs> Amazon. Someone is here. Roscoe is telling me all about it. Yes. Okay. Well, so on this first row, because it's a little bit spread out, I'm just going to get my first couple of beads through on my, on my loom. So I've got the thread coming behind the warps. Now I'm going to go back across above the warps. And this is just like we've done every other looming project. And I'm going to take a moment here to get all those beads lined up. And just like most seed bead processes, this first row is kind of snickety. But once you get it, that first row established, you're going to be just sailing right along. Okay. But this is the normal way of looming. That first row. There we go. Look at that. So what I'm watching for is the needle kind of glinting in between each bead. It's quite important here that we have a warp, uh, a weaving thread on the back of the warps and a weaving thread across the top. So we really want to push those beads up between the warps so that we're going across in the top of the hole of the bead. All right, pull my thread through. And if at any time you end up with a bead that's a little bit hard to get the needle through, stop and discard that bead, edit it out for sure. It definitely doesn't need to be in your loom work, okay? So there's that first row went on like pretty nicely. Terrific, Emily, terrific. Right? So uh, let me do a, another row and <clears throat> I'm gonna move this aside so that I can kind of see my um, my colors. I need 411, uh, which I actually ended up putting this dark green and this light transparent blue together. Um, in one bin because they're very different from one another. And I was running out of bins. So, gotcha. Um, and we have about 10 minutes, Em, just so perfect. you can have a time check. All right. Perfect. I'm going to do very quickly here, a couple more rows, one to two more rows. Sure. And then we will, we will close for the day. So changing um, threads. Basically, I would change my thread whenever I have to over to get beads. When I can't reach because my thread is too short, it's time to change beads, uh, change threads. And I do my thread change the same way I do it with most of my loom weave, my, most of my bead weaving. I tie on my, my new thread, leave my old thread kind of hanging out there. And I weave along with my new thread and then um, go back and weave in the new thread. Okay. So I've got my beads on my needle. I took a quick look at them. They looked pretty even. I'm going to slide them underneath my warps. And already these things are, <clears throat> even just with one row on, things are already starting to kind of come together a little bit easier. Okay. Get those first few beads set up just right. and bring my needle through. So satisfying, I have to say. That's what's so lovely about looming is it's very repetitive and you just keep motoring along. And after that first couple rows that are a little bit finicky, things get together and are much happier. Did I miss a row? I did. There we go. Shoot my needle right through and pull things up. So it's pretty typical, again, that you're going to have that pulling together of the warp threads for the beginning of this little 
couple first three rows. And then things are going to hold together and then you're moving right along. Much easier now. Looks great. Looks what else great. I want to talk about today to get you guys going. And I'm just going to look over my quick notes. I think that's we're kind of okay. So, Let me ask you something real quick though about tension. Sure. So I'm noticing when you're pulling two things, you are, when you're pulling your weft threads, and I remember weft by saying that's the weft thread goes right to left and weft rhymes, rhymes with left. So Emily's not pulling those in too tight, I mean, tightly enough, but not super, super tight. And also what about the tension between the rows? So I tend to call this a weaver thread rather than a weft. It's, I don't know. It, it doesn't matter. We call it whatever we mm -hmm. want. Um, I think that the easiest thing to remember to do about tension is to pick a tension and stick to it. Your tension is going to vary maybe some from my tension. And that's all right. What we are looking for mostly with loom, with any kind of bead weaving, is for the thread not to really show very much. So we want the thread to come tight enough that we can't really see the thread in between the beads. Okay. Um, so that's my, my general guide to tension. I Great. find that what I'm going to do at the end of each row is I'm going to make a tension and I'm going to try and stick to it for the whole piece. That's kind of going to be my goal. How's that? Great. All right. Here's a new row with the new color in it. I'm sorry I missed that one color. I thought I had them all on that war on that pattern, but I will. Well, we'll, we'll one. Update. Yeah. Sneaky one hanging out down there in the corner. So now this should work so smoothly, sliding it right along. See that needle glinting in between each bead? That's such a good tip. Um, and it allows you to really pay attention and make sure that you're on the top of the warps. And as I pull over here, just going to give it a little tug. And I'm on my way. Okay. So I think I'm going to change over to black and white beads, black and white and gray. Okay. For your, um, for the... Yeah, Second I'm gonna I'm gonna part. leave this little bit in here, but I think I'm gonna mm -hmm. change over to black and white and gray, and okay, so I'm gonna just double check my measurement here. Um, looks like when my weaving is done, I'll have enough to do. Yeah, it looks like I can just change right over. All right. So my measurement on my necklace that we're gonna finish off next time. And all I would say is when you get done with all of your weaving, you're free to keep to cut it from the loom. Uh, my pendant measures about two and a half inches. And my strap measures about 15, sorry, strap measures about 12 and a half. So, and so the width, uh, just to reiterate, it's 15 beads across the pendant Correct. section. And then what you did was for the pendant, you dropped one thread in the center and did seven on one side and seven on the other. Absolutely. So I really didn't lose a thread at all because right. I just pulled them apart, right? Okay, and it gotcha. Was seven on one side, seven on gotcha. the other. Right? Gotcha. Eight on one side, eight on the other. 16 threads, 15 beads. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. So that was not a design that I figured out particularly. I, I copied that right off that old piece. So. Mm -hmm. So two questions. Sure. If you miss a bead, looming the bead, does the bead fall out? It, it doesn't, if you only miss it on one pass going either below or above. Right it won't, but if you miss it on both passes, it will. Um, only on the one on the end. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have a thread through your beads initially, no matter what. 
And if you somehow miss as you're coming around on the end and go back through that one bead, mm -hmm. but then you pick up all the others, mm -hmm. the one on the end is going to fall out. Mm -hmm. And it's okay because you will have gone around the thread next to the thread on the edge. And so all you need to do is come back in with a thread and, and put the bead back in. You'll be fine. Um, if, there... you find, if you find that you've missed going across the top and their beads are falling down and you can see the warp threads come through, um, you can actually bring in another thread and fix that. It's mm -hmm. not a big deal. Just go right ahead in and, and push the beads up and make sure there's a thread on top and you'll be all right. So the other question is, can you clarify um, the split portion? So sure. after you have woven the pendant, where does your needle and stuff go and how do you do the second half? Sure. I will, I'll demonstrate that for you. Hang on one second. Let me untangle myself. I moved things around. That was a bad move. So let me just grab seven beads. And I'm not going to use a pattern or uh, pick beads up from any kind of, I'll just pick up all the same color. So two, four, six, seven beads. Ugh. So here's perfect. Here's a bead that's really irregular. Can you see how irregular that is? So that would be one yeah. I would, I would set aside far, far away. So I don't pick it up again. So, for the left-hand strap, it's quite easy because you're already tied off to that left-hand edge, right? I'm going to bring along seven beads instead of 15 and push them up between the warps. I'm going to bring my needle in after that eighth thread and go straight across. Just like that. Let's get some more beads. So now I'm just weaving on part of this loom, but I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm gonna bring my needle up in between the warp threads I think that's pretty straightforward, right? So now I have my split happening. When I'm ready to weave the right-hand strap, this will be completely woven or as woven as you want until you want to start the right-hand strap. I'm going to tie a thread onto this warp thread and I'm going to weave right across there. So. I think it's it's very straightforward in the sense of it's really the same. It's just applied a little bit differently. Gotcha. So with the tail of the thread that you tie on, mm -hmm. will you go in and weave that closed later? I will. Okay. I weave in a thread, my tail thread, pretty much the way I weave in um, in any any seed bead weaving, um, I'm I'm avoiding knots here because if I have to go back in and weave in more threads, I don't want to have knots clogging up the holes of the beads. So when my weaver thread gets too short to work with, I'm just going to mm -hmm. let it dangle. I'm going to start up a new one and start weaving. Mm -hmm. Once I've gotten a few rows on, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to weave that warp thread back in. Let me just weave this warp thread in now. Um, mm -hmm. I could do that with this tail as well, which is why I leave a goodly tail, because I want to be able to put it on a needle easily. Mm -hmm. I like to do about three direction changes. So this is where I'm stopping. I'm going to start a new thread. I'm going to weave through a few beads and pop out. And you can use the edge of the beadwork to change directions but don't end your thread on the edge. So that was one thread direction change. Here's two thread direction changes. Mm 
I just dropped down a row. I'm going to go through a few less beads, just three instead of five. Give that a little tug. So the thread is right in between there. That's okay. And here's my third thread direction change. Mm. So I, I think three is kind of my minimum. Um, I can do more if I want, but the more we fill up those holes with thread and the more irregularly, irregularly you do that move, the more f f stiffness that you're going to build in. So I want to do just what's necessary and no more. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I try not to end my thread on an edge because it's very, very difficult to trim that thread close and not have it be poking out. So you can do this with a thread burner or with a scissor. So let me ask you this, um, when, and I'm trying to remember at the retreat when you did the one for your sister, mm -hmm. let's say that someone wants to get kind of a larger overall picture of the piece that they're making. Can they weave one side of the strap, maybe, I don't know, 20 rows and then do the other 20 rows on the other side? Sure. Does it make a difference? No, it doesn't make any difference at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can weave that strap in whatever, whatever, um, uh, configuration that you want. I found weaving one meant I just focused on that one side right. and then I did the second. And I, I, again, building a little bit of habit into what you're doing, I think makes it easier. Mm -hmm. um, like I wouldn't be switching back and forth every four or five rows. Right. Sure. Right. Um, because I you think, need some kind of a flow. Yeah. 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 And so uh, another couple questions. Sure. So you just weave your thread in. Do you actually tie a knot where it is? Nope. No knots, right? No knots. Okay. In fact, m for my own work, mostly I go back and untie this knot. Mm -hmm. So uh, the bad thing about knots is they're really not going to hold very tightly unless you've tied it a couple of times. Right. That becomes unsightly. And... It means that that hole of the bead that's right next to the knot may not be as open for me for later. Right, plugged, right. So I, I really like to finish my weaving by weaving in the threads. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you can glue these and attach a clasp to them. You can weave them with some thread to make a selvage. You can clamp something down on it. But I love the look of how clean this looks without that. So I, I've already taken my two side threads and mm -hmm. woven them in. So I like to make sure my threads from my weaving, um, my warp threads are as long as possible. So once you get this whole loom woven, you're going to cut in the back, um, the threads in the back, and that'll let the piece come off the loom. And then you'll be able to have these threads to weave with. At the base of the pendant, I'm going to weave in each thread, and I'm going to weave it in with an irregular pattern. So mm -hmm. every time I pick up a thread and start to weave it in, one thread's going to weave little short jogs back and forth. The next thread, I'm going to weave kind of long jogs. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I alternate side to side to make sure I'm not pushing too much thread between each of those That's rows at the beginning so it doesn't flare out. Now at the end, down here, when we come to weave these guys in, and, and if you guys want to jump ahead and, and knock this whole thing out and show us all up over two weeks and in a week you can <laughs> you can when you get to the end it's easiest to weave in about half of the threads on each side because mm -hmm. you're not going to really need them all so weave in about half and then the other half will use to actually join them and the join mm -hmm. will be seamless you won't be able right. to see where that join happened mm -hmm. um i did ha I do have one little problem that I really wish I had made a different decision at the end of this particular strap. These little pink beads, this 2024, they're actually quite a bit narrower. Than yeah, I can actually beads. even see them. They feel yeah. And I'm really sorry that I'm going to have this at my join because mm -hmm. it's not going to be as seamless as it could be. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a little bit of a, uh, there'll be a little bit of a thing there, which I will know about. And maybe if I hadn't told you, you would never have noticed, yeah. but um, it's going to be a little, there's a little bit of a difference in width there. Mm -hmm. So that's all right. I will, I will get over it. So let me ask you, uh, there's another couple questions I have. Sure. 
so the salvage, uh, the warp threads that yes. you have, uh, or the weft threads rather that you have remaining, you could also use those for tassels, if you were going to put a tassel on this piece, correct? The, sure, the warp threads coming, if you wanted to do um, fringe at the bottom of this, mm -hmm. absolutely you could. Yep. Okay. So there's another there's another thing which we'll do later in this year, promise you. We're actually going to do a piece with beaded warps. So we're actually going to bead onto these threads, these warp threads first, mm -hmm. and then we're going to weave. And so there's going to be some sections that will have beading going vertically as well as that horizontal look. Mm -hmm. And that's a really fun way to go to. Um, mm -hmm. I think that would be a, a nice addendum to this guy. Yeah. Um, a quick question. There was a question that Alice had earlier. When you are pushing the beads after you've woven the beads um, and put the beads in their own little sections, is it easier to leave the needle in the beads when you're placing them or do you take the needle out and place them? So when I come from the back with the beads on the thread, mm -hmm. um, I don't like my needle being in there. Mm -hmm. It's much easier with the thread. The thread is much more flexible. You can bend it to your will and then pull th all the thread through and then put the needle back through across the top. Mm -hmm. So okay. I don't leave my needle back here trying to push my beads up the needle is too big um and it's holding the beads from being able to press up in between the warps gotcha um and in the handout emily i think you've got a nice photo of the full necklace but do you mind uh just getting one final so everyone can kind of see the the whole shebang yep um let me if, zoom out a little bit okay kate's trying to get me to be a better uh sorry camera person so this is the same um palette the same as the pattern that's in the back here let me move this loom mm -hmm. out of the way that's actually the same as what's in the background and that section that beaded section i think you said was about two and a half inches or so yeah and then and the, the straps are about 12 12 you and a half to 13 12 and a half yeah and you folks can adjust these lengths to whatever you want, just repeat the pattern. You know, the pattern is such that you can kind of interpret it mm -hmm. um, to what works for you. Yeah, you can reassign number, color numbers if you like, your mm -hmm. choice, mm -hmm. your choice. It's, it's all in the handout. We're gonna update the handout to just fix Sorry. that. Um, but you'll also see it, I think, when you, yeah. when you uh when you work with it so um people are saying the beaded warp is blowing everyone's mind so oh, the beaded warp's really cool we'll do that later this year for sure yeah um, and in the second part of the video emily's gonna go over the closure and all of that so today we're gonna stop it here you have the tools you need to get everything started and start your weaving and then on the eighth we're gonna reconvene and um and finish this up so i'm going to put all of us emily here on the screen okay there we are and let me move this down and i'm actually going to take uh there we go that's good um so i think we're set so uh everyone is loving how everything looks i'm super excited to have you join us again on the 8th um we are all hoping that your little bump in the COVID road will uh, will uh, what a pain in the neck will clear. I know. It's just, um, so uh, you and I, I'll be seeing you in Tucson yep. uh, next week if all goes well. Um, on Friday, uh, everyone, there's a little bit of feedback, so I'm going to mute you for just a second, Emily. Um, on Friday, folks, I have a flash sale to kick off my Tucson. It's all right here. My Tucson travels. So that's going to be on Friday. You're going to see me there. Um, next week, 
Uh, Emily, I've unmuted you again. Next week, uh, you're going to see my adventures running around. You'll see Emily again. You're going to see us in Tucson. I've got a special guest that's joining me. Janice is staying uh, home to attend to all sorts of things that are going on behind the scenes. So uh, next week is going to be a busy week for us. Um, I will be updating you and we'll be updating you through the newsletter, um, what's happening with Tucson. I also wanted to give you folks a big uh, thank you for uh, purchasing those Tucson boxes. Um, I'm already thinking about those things. Um, and so I'll give you some sneak peeks about that. Uh, but I really, really appreciate it. Um, Emily, everyone is thanking you so much and saying that they just love this piece. They haven't loomed before and now they can't wait. Oh my uh, gosh. This, I mean, if this is your first looming piece, I am many applause, many applause, but be confident that it's really not a very difficult process. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and it is a lot of lather, rinse, repeat. So you'll get, the more you do it, the smoother, more sleek, everything will begin to kind of fall into place for you. Um, you know, set yourself up with good light and plenty of caffeine and be all ready and you'll go right along on this. I promise. <laughs> You'll be ready. And so folks, do remember you can find all of the information on the project and the products from today's uh, broadcast right on our website. This sample is called um, Log Cabin. Uh, jump over to the projects. Right now it's on the homepage because we're live on January 25th. But if you go to projects, um, you can even type in Log Cabin. It'll come up. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter for the latest discounts, giveaways, and new products. Um, it'll keep me in touch with all of you with what's going on with Tucson. And do remember that today was part one of the Log Cabin. Emily will be back on the 8th of February to finish up what has become or what is an amazingly epic project. <laughs> Absolutely. And now I have set myself a lot of pressure to do it black and white and gray, but I am excited for that. It's going to look it's, really, really cool. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Yep. Well, everyone is showing their sincere gratitude and a big thanks and hopes that you're feeling better uh, pretty soon. Absolutely. I already feel better. So it's yeah. now it's just a matter of some time going by. So yep, playing the waiting game. Yep. All right, everybody. Well, thank you ever. So I will be back on Friday for the flash sale. That flash sale will go live after free tip Friday, after I share all of this stuff with you. So, um, stay tuned to the newsletter for all the details if you're not familiar. Thanks again, M and I'll see you in Tucson. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.